none of you should have, well, that's not true. Any of you could have done this. Again, so the way that I'm doing the last bits of these, these lectures, this lecture series, is to give you papers and have you read the primary literature and then try to synthesize it a bit for you. And that is a way, maybe not as much for the graduate students, but for the undergraduate students, uh, providing a pathway about how we actually go about developing this material and also a way of providing you with the most recent up-to-date. So the textbook is out of date as soon as they print it. Of course, it's actually out of date well before that because it takes years to synthesize and then produce. And that's not the textbook's pro problem. That's just the nature of the beast. And I, no author will argue that their textbook is, uh, as published, is up-to-date at the moment. So it's nice to be able to go into the literature and draw these out. So in some ways, this is how we actually build uh, these lectures. So that's why I'm trying to do it this way. So if you are if you're a stellar student, you've already read these papers. If you're less than a stellar student or a normal student, then you may not have read these papers yet because this is, this is for Wednesdays. But we'll get started anyway. One of the things that I wanted to show you guys because I think it's really cool is we have uh, lots of hadrosaurs, right? I mentioned before that we have gut content from these guys. And we can use that gut content to look at how these guys interacted <coughs> in their systems and to compare them to see how their systems may have been similar to our own and different from our own because we have similar uh, habitats in that way. We're going to deal with a ceratopsian that lived in the la very late Cretaceous. So this is, a, this is a species that probably existed at the KT extinction event and that would have shared its space with some of the stuff that we've already looked at and thought was pretty cool. So things like Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus, Quetzalcoatlus, um, Ankylosaurus, and then a bunch of other uh, members that you would also recognize. A lot of the members, it turns out, come from the late Cretaceous. People are very comfortable with the late Cretaceous. I don't know why this is good. People are very comfortable with the late Cretaceous and know a lot about it. Some of the other ones they're not as familiar with. So the, the animal here is extracted from the Hell Creek Formation. The Hell Creek Formation, again, is a late, very late Cretaceous deposit, and it actually straddles uh, the KT boundary. So you can find uh, the, the Eocene on the other side and the Cretaceous uh, below it. It is present, you can see here, in a number of different states. You can, in fact, go and me, look in the Hell Creek Formation. The Hell Creek Formation is named after Hell Creek, uh, but it is uh, an ancient fossil uh, seashore, basically. It's a, it's a seashore that was present. It moved back and forth, so not every, not every deposit is from the same, is, is from uh, near uh, uh, saltwater systems, but they are often in the, either in the, the freshwater plain that runs out into it, or very near the ocean, or sometimes fully submerged within the ocean as the sea levels went up and down, sort of washing back and forth um, across the habitat. It's also really nice because you can tell North Dakota, South Dakota, there's not a lot of cover up here, so you can get down and actually see the deposits. So this is what it actually looks like, right? It makes it really easy to look for, easy, it makes it easier to look for things because you don't have a lot of plant cover and you can walk along uh, and it's also eroding relatively quickly, right? All this exposed rock every time it rains is being eroded and then removed by the, the streams that are currently present. You'll also notice there's this dark black line. We're not going to talk about this dark black line, but you'll notice it's very different from the rest of the rocks around it, and that should give you an indication that something very important happened there. So like I said, the Hell Creek Formation is literally the line below the line. So it is the separation between what we think of as the Cenozoic and the Mesozoic, right? It is the literal line. In fact, a lot of studies have examined the KT boundary by looking at the Hell Creek Formation because it straddles those two. And this is a good example of what it would have looked like, right? So if we look at a certain point in time, uh, we may imagine it's right here, but maybe in, a, in an earlier time it's, it's fully under the ocean or what would be a continental sea. And then maybe at another time it would have been further inland. But the, uh, the location is roughly the same. It's this alluvial plain. There's a bunch of rivers that are slowing down, fanning out, and then sort of dumping into the continental shelf. Uh, into the continental uh, ocean that was present that would have divided uh, what we think of as North America into two halves. So you would have had uh, the, the rock, what would have been the Rockies forming uh, that were feeding the stream system, and then we have Appalachia, which uh, would have been its own separate system and would have not been forming but eroding or continuing to erode away as it is today. In any case, this system would have been a relatively lush and productive system in that way, right? Lots of water coming in, access to warm, shallow, uh, continental seas and a relatively warm earth. Right. So I'm, we're going to be out of time at this point. Okay, so we stopped 
just prior to this slide, but I'm not going to jump back to it. But I was talking about the ecology of, remember, we're talking about ecology of hadrosaurs, ecology of a particular species of hadrosaur. And I was warning you that North America at the time of that, which is just before the mass extinction event, is split into two. There's an Appalachia, which is where we are, right? We would be located somewhere within the Appalachians or Appalachia. And then there's this additional piece uh, that we would know as the, 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 that is the sort of California, Washington, Oregon, Alaska corridor here. And the Western Interior Seaway is in fact that, a very shallow sea. And because it's very shallow, that means that it acts uh, like a lake in some ways. And so it's extremely productive because the bottom habitat is well connected to the upper portions of the water column. And so you get a lot of production within there. So there's lots of marine animals living and growing and dying within that. And actually, if you go and find Cretaceous rocks from these marine sediments, you will find that they're very productive, but there's lots of stuff in them to go find. But I just want to remind you that North America at this time is currently split. It would have been patrolled by things like, this is not a T-Rex, although it probably looks very similar to what a T-Rex would be, that would have walked along the, the, the shorelines and would have fed on uh, animals within them as well. So a large and diverse uh, predator-prey complex, both offshore and uh, on the terrestrial side. This is the actual species that's in the paper. It's an Edmontosaurus. I'm not worried about you knowing the species name. I just want you to know that it's an Edmontosaurus. And of course, I wanted you to see what the bones look like. So it's a very classic uh, example of what we think of a hadrosaur, right? This is, if you were to draw a hadrosaur, this is what you would draw by and large. So this is what we have in the paper. Here's a little baby one. Again, we don't know that mothers protected offspring as they're larger, right? You might get some indication of that if you had lots of little footprints around uh, a big footprint, but that we don't necessarily know that. Probably smaller animals did herd with the larger animals when they were moving for protection. And this is, I'm going to show you, of course, figures from the paper. Like I said, this is a summary of that paper in some ways. So left is the actual dig site. It's very similar to what you've seen uh, in other things, and it's certainly very similar to that video on T-Rex that you saw because the, the formations are the same. There's an area that's just an exposed piece of uh, rock with bones, and then they cover it with tarps when they're working on it. This is a very, very well-preserved specimen, so it's unusual in its preservation. And as a result, we have very, very nice uh, preservation of the skin on top of other things. But of course, if you look at this skin, you may not be able to see it from where you're sitting, but if you look at this skin, it has those really distinctive hexagonal scales. So if you were to see it up close, you would very rapidly identify it. You can see these very large scoots that sit out and above on top of them. We have actually a very good idea about what this animal looked like, right? And if you look at, so they, they examined two things. They examined the stuff that was in the gut. So they had the gut well enough preserved that they could actually look at it. And they examined the material that was around the animal, so the stuff that was buried at about the same time as it, or at the same time as it. And what they found in the stuff that was buried around it, right, this is a plant assemblage they found. There are things like a variety of algae uh, and, and diatoms, which are classic to freshwater environments. Dinoflagellates, which are classic to marine environments, so you're sitting right at the edge of those two, a predominant freshwater environment with some occasional influence from a marine environment, we call those estuaries, right? And this would have been fairly far up in the estuary because you would have had relatively few marine uh, animals coming in, but they do occasionally mix, probably when tides are very high. A couple of things like uh, bryophytes, so, so you can think of the, the mosses and those sort of families, the liverworts. Some angiosperms, actually fairly well represented. Remember, this is the end of the Cretaceous. Angiosperms are present in the environment, not super abundant, but they are present in the environment. And then, of course, lots and lots of gymnosperms, which you have, we've talked about many, many times, and tended to be the dominant land plant uh, when, when, during all the periods we're talking about. And, of course, lots and lots of ferns, right, ferns everywhere. And so the understory will be ferns. The upper story will tend to be gymnosperms. And then angiosperms will be mixed within that, but will tend to be lower. You're not going to, usually, you're not going to get very, very large angiosperms at this time. They also looked at what was in the gut of the hadrosaur. And this turned out to be very, very different. And so that gives you some indication about a couple of things. I, I just want you, this thing up here, UFTOM, is unconsolidated um, organic material. It means that they couldn't identify it, is basically what it means, right? So it is, it's unidentified material. It's not that much, actually, it's about 9%, which is pretty good. Even in a gut content from a living animal, you would expect to find lots of material you couldn't get, actually figure out exactly where it had come from, right? And that's not unsurprising. If I gave you a handful of soil, you might be able to guess where some of its 
composed of, but honestly you don't know, right? Especially if it's near an aquatic system. Some of it could be production from the, the, the waters that are washing up and drying on the shore. Most of it will be terrestrial plants that are breaking down in that material around it. Some of it will also be some of the rocks that are also breaking down around it as well and contributing to that. So it's hard even in those cases. But within the gut, of course, there are things that we expect. There's things like spores and pollen grains, cuticles and phytoclasts. But a lot of the gut is taken up by what? What are those three largest components that take up the gut? Yep. Right. And so what is what is that? What will, that's predominantly from what? Browsing. It's from browsing, but it's from trees, right? So it comes from hard woody trees. Well, not hard. We don't think hardwoods here. These are what we call softwoods, right? But a lot from woody trees. There's a couple of really important things we can tease out of this. One is if the animal has more than 50% of its gut composed of wood, that suggests to you that the animal probably can digest wood. Right? And what do animals that digest wood often have associated with them? Bacteria. They do. They have, to, they have bacteria. As far as we know, uh, uh, eukaryotes are, or it's a, I should say multicellular eukaryotes, are incapable of digesting wood by and large. And that's certainly true amongst the animals. I know of no animal that can natively digest wood. Termites, of course, do digest wood, but they themselves do not. They're dependent on endosymbionts to do it. So if this animal has that much wood in it, it would suggest to you that it is a wood specialist. And that would also suggest that it probably has fairly differentiated gut uh, and that some of the gut is, is uh, given over to endosymbionts that do nothing but digest wood. That is interesting in and of itself. This is what we think of as a classic run-of-the-mill hadrosaur. And this animal is chewing, oh yes, very much so, but it's not chewing plant material for the purpose of leaves, right? It's not chewing down nice uh, uh, soft material. It's chewing and consuming really hard wood material and maybe exposing that for endosymbionts to break down, right? So this animal is apparently a wood specialist. Right, it acts like a large uh, termite in that case. What does the charcoal let you know about the environment? Right, wildfires, and it produces this high carbon wood. Right, so charcoal lets you know, and this is true in common in native e um, uh, ecosystems that we have today, that wildfires are relatively common in softwood environments, and these animals are probably living uh, through areas that had that would occasionally burn, maybe even annually burn. And so as they're chewing woody material, they're also incorporating a little, they're probably not getting very much out of it, but they're consuming charcoal as well from stumps or twigs that were also partially burned, and then they would eat the rest of that thing at the same time. So I just want to give you some idea uh, that the, we talked, we have talked about, of course, hadrosaur diet, and I've talked a lot about them eating plants, but you also need to keep in mind that uh, woody debris is also very much a food source for some animals, and dinosaurs appear to also have exploited that in some cases. Even these very common run-of-the-mill individuals or run-of-the-mill species appear to have been uh, maybe even specialized in that way, right? So that there is a lot of differentiation. So I talked a little bit about this already. Uh, the skeleton, because it's so well preserved, lets you know that the animal died and was buried almost immediately, right? So it was located right there when it died. That's where it ended up. It didn't move very far. There are pollen spores that represent local material, but the pollen spores and the stuff that's within the gut don't match, and that may be because the pollen spores in the environment are not a random sample of what's in the environment. They're a sample at that moment in time of the stuff that's least likely to break down. So you have to be a little bit careful about just matching pollen spores with what you find in the environment. We have very good indications of what the animal looks like. And that also gives us really good indications about things like the distance between bones, right? Because we have the animal preserved, bones, of course, do not fl lie flush to one another. They're separated by cartilage. And when you have an animal that's preserved in an articulated fashion, we could actually get very good estimates of that. So these kind of animals are really important for estimating the real weight of dinosaurs because we can get a real estimate of the length of the leg, for instance, that we can't get elsewhere. What else can we learn? Well, certainly this animal ate a lot of wood, and therefore it probably had gut microbes, like I mentioned before. And then, of course, forest fires must have been relatively common. And for gymnosperm environments, which are softwoods and pines frequently, uh, and that would have been the case in, in this location as well, that's actually fairly common. This is, a, this is a, a forest fire in that a very similar environment, right? The pines have very fine needles, which burn very, very rapidly, and pines are often well adapted to having uh, 
forest fires pass over them and not damage them very much, right? We can go into pine forests in New Jersey, and one of the important things that maintains those what are called pine barrens is that forest fires regularly burn there and destroy other understory plants that would outcompete the pines in that case. The pines, again, being resistant to the burning, it does injure them to some degree, but not very much. Their, their bark it provides some protection to the actual tree itself, and so they replace uh, and maintain that, uh, that protective coating so that they're not damaged year to year. And in fact, some of these pine cones actually don't split until they get burned, right? So until they get burned, the seed does, is not exposed in that way. And this is also from your figure, that, that uh, uh, paper as well, this figure from that paper. And it gives you one, it's sort of an up-to-date picture of it, but it gives you a picture of what the ecosystem would have looked like for this animal. And that more and more is what we're interested in. Yes, dinosaurs are very, very cool, but outside of their ecosystem, they're just sort of novelties. When we place them back into the ecosystem and study it that way, they become these really, really interesting animals, right, because they function in some of the same ways and in sometimes very different ways from modern animals. So this is something like what it would have looked like. You can see that there are probably little backwaters that would have supported fresh water, and then this would have been the main body of the estuary where there would have been occasional mixing with salt waters. Lots of trees, uh, but also plenty of low covered vegetation, most of the trees being uh, um, uh, softwoods, and then the low cover being a mix of a variety of different species or different groups of plants at that time, right? And then in this environment, you can imagine this animal also being hunted by things like T. rex, right? So T. rexes are, are, would be patrolling in these areas and, and looking to fi either find injured animals or potentially sick animals and then bringing them down, maybe even healthy animals if they can catch them off guard. And so the other thing I was going to say about this is these animals are probably well adapted to swimming as well, so you may anticipate that they're probably fairly comfortable getting in and out of the water and moving between these habitats. And in the paper, they make the argument that these guys appear to be more associated with these lush uh, uh, riverine systems than the ceratopsians, which appear to be further back and in more arid environments. The ceratopsians are more exposed open areas, like things, uh, like things that more like wildebeest and uh, uh, these guys are more like deer in that way, more within the actual forest organically in that case. And that does actually make some sense too. Ceratopsians, of course, with large frills and eyes that are fairly low set would have a hard time guessing exactly where that frill is when they're walking through a forest and their heads would get hung up. So they probably don't spend a lot of time in really dense forests, right? That's just probably not a great habitat for them to be in. Okay, so that's one paper we've looked at and you guys will read that if you haven't already. And then there's this additional paper, and this is one that looked at the teeth of Camarasaurus, and that looked at them to see if potentially we could see differences between uh, where they're located during different times of the year. And this, of course, is a skeleton of one, and this is a good example of another skeleton that's articulated, and by and large, the bones are well set and probably in the positions that they were when the animal died, right? So again, giving you information about how far away they are from one another. I just wanted to impress upon you the weight and the, the, uh, the, the sort of the size of these animals. These are what we call the underprints. So these are sauropod prints, but you're looking at the bottom. So they've compressed the, the sediments above them, and then of course they were buried and filled in. And these are the, the undersides, right? And so they're, they're putting a lot of weight down. If you could get a good estimate of how soft the sediment was when these guys were standing on it, of course, you would know very, you would have a very good idea about uh, how heavy these animals are. But just by looking at that and knowing that that appears to be a sort of sandy soil, uh, probably in a more, uh, uh, an environment with at least some water, so that they would be just a little bit soft, you can imagine how much weight is sitting on top of that to push that down. This is, the animal in this is from what's called the Morrison Formation. The Morrison Formation, at least a very small part of it, is underneath uh, Dinosaur National Monument, which if you do have a chance to go and visit, Unfortunately, Dinosaur Man National Monument is literally in the middle of nowhere. It takes hours to get there, and it's the only thing around. But it is very cool. There's this, parsh, but this part of the quarry which is exposed. They do actually work on it still. Um, this part of the quarry which is exposed, if you look at it, it's literally just bones. I mean, it's just bones on bones on bones on bones. The rock is extremely hard. It takes a fair amount of time to get these things out. But a lot of these animals uh, that, are, that are lost within here are disarticulated, although occasionally some elements of them may be articulated when you find them. And they will have, when you stand above it, right, this doesn't really give you a good scale, but when you stand here at the edge and look down, there's lots of bones and they point out, you know, these are the different bones. And the, the um, uh, rangers will walk along and point out, they'll have shows at different times of day, walk around and point to different bones that are exposed at that time. 
The Morrison Formation is very different. So we were just talking about Cretaceous rocks and at the very end of the Cretaceous. The Morrison Formation, of, it falls within the Jurassic and tends to be towards the late Jurassic, right? Uh, we're sitting somewhere within the upper Jurassic here. And of course, therefore, the, the, the predominant herbivores in this case are probably sauropods at this time and not hadrosaurs, right? Hadrosaurs are not the dominant herbivore at this point. The surface of the Earth is very, very different, not least of which this inland sea has not split North America. So North America uh, animals would be very, very similar across the entire range. However, uh, South America and, of course, North America are now split and wouldn't be connected. And South America and Africa are still connected, so those animals would be the same. But for us, anyway, uh, the other important thing is that the Rockies are growing, right? The Rockies are just starting to appear, and they are, they are becoming uh, those mountains that we think of. And the, remember, the Appalachian Mountains are, uh, uh, what, uh, 150 million years younger, so they'd be quite a bit higher. The Adirondacks are quite high today, but they would be much more so if they had 150 million years less erosion, right? Think about the rate of erosion of a mountain, even if it's something very, very small, like a millimeter per year. When you multiply a millimeter per year by 150 million, then you get a pretty big number, and that would be added to the top of what you see already. So there'd be a lot more mountain there. And what the authors used, I'm not going to have you worry too much about this, but I just want you to understand. What the author used are isotopes. Isotopes, of course, are elements that have the same number of protons but share different numbers of neutrons. So the charge remains the same. So what we say is that the chemical reaction is identical because the chemistry behaves in a similar manner. But the nuclear reactions are different because the nuclear, the nucleus is different from one atom to another. There are lots of isotopes. I think a lot of people have a misunderstanding about this. Lots of isotopes that are stable, and there are also many, 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 many isotopes that are radioactive. But we often think of isotopes as inherently being unstable. That's absolutely not the case. Everything is an isotope of itself. Uh, the, the elements that we often deal with that we think of as unreactive, of reactive elements, even within those elements, things like uranium, there are stable isotopes, right? So we have to be a little bit careful. In any case, they looked at, I, they looked at oxygen. Oxygen, there's actually two graphs up here, but the, the reasoning is because they, they, they correlate very strongly with each other. Oxygen isotopes, at least oxygen 18, which is very heavy relative to what most oxygen is, which is 16, right? That's the usual weight for oxygen. It responds very, very strongly to evaporation, and it, it, it changes the concentration of oxygen-18 in the environment. And what you're seeing here is the same thing you see with, let's say, uh, a contour for uh, elevation. The, el the, the ones uh, that are in blue have the lowest concentration of O18, and the ones up here in red have the highest concentration of O18. And by and large, what you're seeing is differences in precipitation. So where precipitation is very, very high, O18 is, is very, 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 very low relative to what we, can, what we are using here, which is a standard. And where precipitation is very, very low, then O18 is very, very different because it has lots of time to be different from that original source material in that way. The one, the one below that is hydrogen. It responds in an identical fashion. Um, and it, uh, it's up here because it was in the paper that, that uh, much of this work is based upon, and also because I just wanted to stress the similarity in these contours, right? They're actually pretty stable. Well, that's fine. Oxygen is different. We established that in water, but there's lots of oxygen in the environment. There's lots of oxygen in everything from calcium carbonate, right? There's oxygen sitting right there. We can identify that to all sorts of other stuff, right? And carbonate is a really important, calcium carbonate is a really important component of things like teeth. And tooth enamel is really, a, uh, has a huge amount of carbonate and calcium within it, as you know, because you're not supposed to drink lots of soda, right? Which breaks that down. Enamel, of course, is really, really, really hard stuff. Some of the hardest stuff, certainly some of the hardest stuff that any animal produces is enamel. Enamel, in fact, can be so hard that sometimes we don't actually get a fossil of the enamel and, and, enamel and that the, the material has actually been replaced, but the enamel itself actually persists through time. So the enamel that you hold in your hand was the same enamel that the animal used on its tooth, right? It's identical in that shape. So this stuff uh, covers the outside of the tooth. In humans, that is interesting in the sense that I've built my enamel and I do, uh, I, my, I, I do spend some amount of energy uh, recovering and repairing that enamel. But as you know, enamel can wear down and then you end up with just little stubby teeth. Well, that's annoying uh, because that means that we don't get a long-term snapshot with my teeth, right? You wouldn't be able to learn as much about me. 
But if your teeth grow consistently and constantly, right, then you actually could get a snapshot because you'd have teeth growing. And as the teeth would grow, you could measure them at different locations. So this is a skull, and of course we know that the teeth are growing throughout the animal's life, right? And so one of the things that this, the teeth will do is the oldest element of the tooth will, of course, be nearest to the surface. It's the, it's the actual nipping portion. Remember, these are not chewers. This is the nipping portion. Of course, the nipping portion is also being ground down, right? Every time you bite down, you lose a little tiny bit of the enamel. This animal is doing this over and over and over and over and over, and the tooth wears down. But thankfully for it, the tooth is also growing up. So the wear down is equivalent to the growth up, or hopefully it will be. Otherwise, the animal will have big buck teeth and won't be able to, to nip on anything. But that the growth up will compensate for that. That means the stuff at the bottom is the newest material. It's the material that's been added to that tooth, and it, it reflects, therefore, the environment the animal is currently in, whereas the old material reflects the environment the animal was in. Right. So it functions very much like a typewriter. If you've ever seen a typewriter, which I think you probably have because we have enough similar hipster people on or near campus. If you haven't, just go to a Starbucks and wait for that guy with the scarf to come in and you'll know. The tooth functions like this, the chewing surface, in this, I should say the nipping surface. I've written chewing surface here, but you'll have to forgive me. Uh, the nipping surface is at the top and the tooth rolls through that, right? And, and the oldest material at the bottom, uh, or the oldest material at the top is exposed. Uh, a, a, and as it's worn away, newer material is pushed up to take its place. So when they looked across the tooth, what they found is that there are differences. You don't have to know the numbers. I'm not concerned about you knowing the numbers. I just want you to appreciate what they're saying. So the oxygen uh, uh, concentrations are very, of, of O18 are very, very different. And what it's saying is, look, O18 is relatively um, uh, uh, rare, and that's probably reflective of it being in a basin's highland migration, or I should say it's relatively common on the scale, in a basin's highland migration. And then at some point, it moves into a highland occupation, right, and it seems to do that, and sort of all of these animals appear to do that by and large, and that appears to occur uh, within these animals following along as you get nearer and nearer to the root. You don't see the opposite pattern where animals are going up. So these animals are probably occupying basin highlands at some point, and that uh, probably is uh, at the uh, uh, at the so that's at the tooth tip. So that's that's at their the earlier portions of the year, and then uh, they they will move up into the highlands, and then they will live there for some portion of the year, and then they will come back. Right, so they're migrating up into highlands, back down onto the plains, up into the highlands, back down onto the plains, and that actually makes fairly good sense. Uh, we have a lot of I don't care about this little red arrow. The animals probably left in the dry season, right? So they probably leave the lowlands as the dry season approaches. The lowlands are drying out. Plant life is, is perishing or is going dormant. Uh, predators, of course, will have nice long lines of sight to you. And the, the uh, environment around you will become relatively hot day round. Right? There's not a lot of rain, and so they'll be exposed to lots of sunlight. And probably at that point move up into more highland environment. Those that at that point uh, the animals are going to the, the the plant growth may not be nearly as high as it would be on the lowlands, but it will be cooler and there will be uh, the opportunity maybe to find some plant material that's still alive. When the season reverses again to the wet season and that those areas become lush again, then the animals migrate down or just before it migrate down and are ready to go as soon as the plant material comes out. The animals in this uh, apparently died in the wet season or at the very start of that, and would you expect that to be the case? What does that suggest to you? That they're not very good swimmers? It might be that they're not very good swimmers, um, but it probably, let's imagine that the water hasn't arrived yet. What's probably happening to them? Yeah, so that, of course timing is uncertain, so it may be that they're not swimming well. There may be flash floods at the beginning of a wet season, but it may also be, of course, that you have to predict when the, the wet season is going to happen, and so animals may come down to feed. It may be a particularly bad dry season, and that the animals that just barely made it through or that aren't doing particularly well, of course, will starve before they have the opportunity to feed uh, when the wet season rolls around. Or it could be something like that, a catastrophic event in the wet season where you arrive, there's a really enormous flood, and then everybody dies, right? That's, that's too close to the big river. 
And then, of course, you would expect, uh, in this case, that other animals are going to follow a very similar pattern, not different from ecosystems today, uh, that other animals will follow a similar pattern, including predator and prey animals. So maybe predators, it's a good thing on that year when it's a dry season, but the following year when there's far fewer animals, then it becomes punishing in the sense that there's less prey animals available to you. And, of course, you can add some other things, like did all animals migrate, at least in their study. It looks like all of the animals are migrating, but maybe other animals don't migrate. Some maybe do. Okay, so we have now covered the first part, and now I'm going to go into the ecology of reproduction. And the reasoning for this is because I, I think w there's not a lot of information on dinosaur reproduction, but I think it's such a critical component of any animal's lifespan that we have to really con we have to start to think about it uh, organically within the ecology of these guys because they, it is so critical. It is the reason to grow, right? That you don't just grow to get big. You grow so you can reproduce, so you can produce more offspring than everybody else. 